All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation this afternoon. We are here kicking off the spring 2023 lecture series, What's Next for the Clean Energy Grid? And my name is Wendy Cho. I'm the Content and Outreach Senior Manager at Actera. Our guest speaker today is Tom McCalment. He is the CEO of Paired Power, and we're so thrilled to have him here with us to delve into this important topic, renewables and the grid, challenges and opportunities in our energy future. Not only does the entire climate community care about what happens with renewable energy, but it's also a, an issue of deep concern for all residents and businesses and communities around the Bay Area as we consider reliability, resilience, and equity in the grid. So I will start with an overview of Actera for those who are new to this organization. Um, we are an environmental organization based in Palo Alto, and our mission is bringing people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. We've been doing this on the ground, engaged with our communities since 1970. Um, and our work involves two approaches, education to encourage behavior change, and also advocacy to encourage smarter policies to address climate change on a more systemic level. So here are some ways that we're combating climate change. We have four major pillars to our work. Beneficial electrification, that's the acceleration of the transition to fossil free devices and transportation. Food and climate change, which is lowering our carbon footprint through the use of uh, plant forward diets, uh, low carbon eating, and reducing food waste. We have an education and youth pillar, which is all about empowering youth and also educating the general public and creating more climate change awareness to solve uh, the problems of climate change. And we have a workplace sustainability program for um, recognizing leadership in the sustainability sector and also resourcing green teams. Let's dive more into our education pillar. We've got a program for middle school students and teachers to help them learn about the challenging concepts of climate change problems and solutions and become change makers in their own communities. We have this wonderful public lecture series where we invite experts from a variety of different fields to um, explore interesting topics, both global and local. We have the Actera Student Ambassadors Program, which is one, which is one of our newest programs, and we're helping uh, high school and college students learn more skills to be able to participate in things like uh, public comments uh, at city council meetings and town halls and get more involved in what their communities are doing in terms of environmental action. And we have two more lectures coming up in the series. We're really excited to bring you on April 19th, Anna Bobat and Nahum Goldberg, who will be talking about a big transformation that went on at LinkedIn, where they were upgrading their kitchens to electric kitchens. Um, that's jointly hosted by the Green Team Network. So we hope you, you will join us for that. And then on May 18th, we have Steve Anglin, who will be talking about concentrated solar power. You can find out more details about our lecture series at actera.org slash lectures. And we have a sampling of some of our other events coming up this month. We have on March 21st, a plant-based induction cooking class. Those are fun, virtual, interactive cooking classes. Um, we have March 23rd, we have our exciting Promise to Our Planet Climate Action Benefit. It's uh, getting kicked off at 5 p.m and that will also be virtual. We hope to see you there. And we have an in-person event coming up on March 26th. It's in Palo Alto, and it's a chance for you to explore some different models of electric vehicles, sit behind the steering wheel, and chat with the knowledgeable EV ambassadors who are um, loaning their vehicles for this purpose. So please check out actera.org slash events for all of our upcoming offerings. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter at actera.org slash subscribe. I want to send a really big thank you out to Mary and Clinton Gilliland and Armand and Elian Nukermans, um, who are our series underwriters, and we're so grateful to them for their support. Also, our programming would not be possible without the generous, the generous support from Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and we're so appreciative of our partners, the Foster and the Green Team Network. And finally, uh, if you appreciate our programming, and we hope you do, we hope that you will also uh, help support the programming at 
actera.org slash donate now. Uh, finally, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you're welcome to use the Q&A feature in the Zoom bar at the bottom to ask your questions of Tom or upvote another question that has already been asked. And after the presentation, we will start the moderated Q&A. So save those questions for that time. Just um, type them in with, as you think of them, though. And he, it's my great pleasure to welcome Tom McCallament. He is the CEO and co-founder of Paired Power. He's a serial entrepreneur with over 20 years experience building innovative, influential, and successful solar businesses, including McCalmont Engineering, Regrid Power, and others. He's the holder of 17 U.S. patents, and he has a demonstrated track record of creatively applying new technology to solving real-world customer problems. So without further ado, uh, Tom, I'll ask you to share your screen and uh, turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Is my audio coming through okay? Yes. Okay. And how about my screen? Yes, we're seeing it. Thank you so much. Great. Well, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. Thank you for, to, to Wendy for that kind introduction. And thank you to Actera for uh, inviting me to, to speak with you. So I like to start off these talks talking about energy and uh, the sources of energy, the costs, uh, leading from that into how we use energy. And then from that, I'll lead into talking more about the challenges and the opportunities uh, that we have in our energy future. But I think the background that I start with will be helpful. Uh, for some of you, it'll probably be a little bit educational. And um, so starting off with energy in America, and, and, and I, I just want to verify the slides are, in fact, advancing. Is that right? Yes, you're good. Good. Okay. So this chart shows... Uh, what powers us, energy sources, um, and how those have transitioned over the last 250 years or so. Uh, we started out 250 years ago. Uh, most of our energy came from wood. And then you can see how the various sources have come online over uh, the last uh, you know, couple hundred years. Renewables really didn't get a start until kind of the mid 80s. That's the little green wedge you see over there on the far right but it is uh, certainly growing ra rapidly. And we'll talk a lot more about that growth. Um, if I overlay this with just a couple data points from the solar industry, uh, Edmund Becquerel actually discovered the PV effect back as far ago as 1839, uh, but he didn't know how to harness it and really didn't know what caused it. Uh, Einstein explained the PV effect, and he actually won the Nobel Prize for that in 1921. Most people think he won for general relativity, but it was not. It was for the PV effect. But it was still another 30-plus uh, years before Bell Labs created the first PV cell, and that was in 1954. And then kind of moved that forward another 50 years or so before net metering um, first began in the United States in the, in the mid-90s. I like to look at what where energy comes from. And so if you look at the orange ball on the left of your screen where the magenta arrow is pointing, so that ball represents the total usage of all the energy on Earth. And total worldwide energy usage as of the time of this chart was about 16 terawatt years per year. It's probably a little bigger than that now. But you can see it's basically a, a ping pong ball. Um, over on the far right of the chart are different types of fossil fuel. You get another kind of tennis ball size, um, certainly more than adequate to meet our needs for some number of years. And then in the middle, uh, we have lots of renewable sources, um, you know, wind, biotech, uh, biomass, geothermal, hydro. And, and you can see that just on the renewable sources in the middle there, we have more than enough energy to meet worldwide usage. But the most astounding ball is the giant beach ball right across the entire screen there, which is solar, 23,000 terawatt years per year of energy. We have a massive source in the sun. So the solar industry in the United States has been growing rapidly over the last 15 years. This chart shows that growth um, from virtually nothing in 2007 to uh, as of the end of last year, it was about 136 gigawatts of cumulative installed capacity. And just to kind of level set that number, a gigawatt is uh, roughly the size of a large coal or nuclear plant. So we've put 136 new power plants of that size into production in the last 15 years. 
The market divides roughly into utility scale solar. That means the utility is putting in those systems and selling the power to you. It's on your on their side of the meter. Um, or distributed solar where uh, individual customers are putting solar in on their own facility on their side of the meter and then using that to re either reduce their load or reduce their electric bill. And the little green wedge there in the middle is community solar. Probably a lot of you on this call buy energy from Silicon Valley Clean Energy or Peninsula Clean Energy or San Jose Clean Energy. Those are all community solar companies um, that sell power to you and provide um, high content of renewables. So this is a sample utility scale solar project. This one was designed by McCalma about uh, seven years ago and just shows you the size that, that uh, were fairly common at that time. This is a 70 megawatt power plant in Millington, Tennessee. And you can see it's fairly big uh, in land use. Uh, you can tell by the size of the buildings and the cars, uh, how, how much land is, how many acres here are in, in production. Just to show you how far we've come in a, in a few years, this is a power plant McCalmont's designing today, more than 10 times the size in land use, just the land alone is five and a half miles wide. This plant is in, uh, is in uh, Illinois. So big growth in utility scale solar. This chart shows over the last decade how, where the additions to generating capacity have occurred. And you can see the yellow bars at the bottom, solar has grown uh, consistently over the last decade. Wind, the, the kind of middle dark teal bars have also grown every year uh, with some ups and downs, but pr pretty consistently uh, larger growth as it moves to the right. Uh, all other forms of energy have shrunk. Uh, natural gas uh, is still being deployed, but in smaller uh, numbers of plants, new plants, um, and virtually everything else is the small black bars at the top. You'll notice if you look at, at the top of 2014 that there's a kind of a dark teal bar there for coal. That's really the last significant investment in the United States in a coal plant was seven years ago. So what's driving this growth? So let's take a look at that. And you know the, the utilities aren't sitting around in their boardrooms talking about, let's be more green or let's be more sustainable. Maybe they are, but the big factor really driving this is cost. And so next I wanna look at um, power plant costs and how we evaluate those and how we look at those. And so just to give a little lesson uh, around that to, to start with, you know, the public always uses these terms interchangeably, power and energy, as if they were the same thing. But in fact, they're not the same thing. Power is instantaneous capacity. It's, it's, it's measured in watts or kilowatts or megawatts. It's how much is available instantaneously by a power plant. And, and when we add that little lowercase h at the back of that uh, acronym, so it's kilowatt hours or megawatt hours or gigawatt hours, that is a reflection of energy. So it's power over time. And just to give you a, you know, a, a way to think about that, if you plug in a 100 watt light bulb, that light bulb is using 100 watts of power instantaneously. When you turn it on, that's what it's using. But over time, it's consuming energy. And so if you run that light bulb for 10 hours, it will consume a, a kilowatt hour of energy. So utilities measure power plant costs in two ways. Um, the acquisition cost, which is their, they, uh, the term we use is cost per watt. And it takes that construction cost and divides it by the power rating of the plant. And then the delivered energy cost, which is what is the energy gonna cost after I build the plant, if I run that plant for its full life. And you know, power plants typically have a life of about 40 or 50 years. So we calculate how much energy that plant's gonna deliver over that time, divide it into the costs, and that gives us the delivered energy cost. So an example, again, uh, if I buy a car and it's $42,000, that was my acquisition costs. If I drive it seven, for seven years, 12,000 miles per year, I drove it 84,000 miles, my, my delivered mile cost or my energy cost was 50 cents a mile. So let's look at that, take those two figures and look at different sources of energy and how they vary by cost. And th this data came mostly from the Energy and, uh, Information Agency of the federal government, but some other good sources there at the bottom of the slide. And you can see for solar and wind, which are both in green there, 
very low costs in both categories, um, low in acquisition costs, low in delivered energy costs, among the lowest on this chart. Now, solar and wind are intermittent. You only get uh, energy when the sun's shining for solar or when the wind's blowing for wind. So coupling those with storage, it, there's great interest in that in the market today because that's a way to time shift uh, that availability, that intermittency. But even with storage, the costs are still relatively low. Um, and you can see there at the top, I, I put solar and storage there, kind of what the representative costs are for it today. If we look down at the bottom of the chart for coal, um, acquisition costs today are $3.50 to $4 uh, a watt. Energy costs are three to six cents. Um, basically three times the cost of solar for acquisition and 50% higher for energy costs. So this is why coal plants are not being built today in the United States. Natural gas is very similar to solar in its acquisition costs, but it's quite a bit more expensive in its energy costs. So gas peaker plants are necessary to keep the grid running um, well, but they are expensive to operate. And I, I said four to 10 cents, but the, the marginal rate per kilowatt hour for a gas peaker plant can be as high as a dollar or a dollar um, 50 at certain times of the day. Nuclear has the reverse problem. It's, it's fairly, uh, inexpensive in the delivered energy, but it's 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 uh, pretty expensive on the front end in terms of the acquisition costs. And I'll just give an example of that. This is the Bodle uh, nuclear plant. It's under construction in Georgia. It's actually been under construction for 30 years. Um, and so far they've invested 30 billion in that plant. Um, it, I, I just read uh, this uh, here in, Jan uh, in this year in January and in March, there were two more delays of the construction of this plant. So they're hoping to get it online uh, this year, but it's still not online. Um, but if you take that 30 billion divided by the, uh, the um, power plant size to 1100 megawatt plants, it's 1364 a watt, a very high uh, acquisition cost in comparison to solar. Using a 40 year life and its capacity factor, expected capacity factor, its delivered cost of energy is about a nickel. So it's still uh, relatively affordable. But to really scale uh, nuclear, the nuclear industry will really need to tackle and do a better job with the acquisition costs because that, that, that long delay, that 30 year delay, is really just not uh, going to get us where we need to be in terms of climate change. I always say that the safest nuclear power plant is the one that's 93 million miles away. I, I, I'm a big fan of nuclear when it's solar. Um, let me talk about the duck curve. So the duck curve is named pretty obviously from its, uh, its shape here. And th this represents net load in California over the last decade or so. And you can see each year, net load in the, in the daytime gets lower, the belly of the duck gets lower. And that's because more and more solar comes online in our state. And so the utilities don't really need any more energy. They're to a point now um, in, in certain days of the year that there's actually a negative cost to, to the energy. There's so much solar available, they have to curtail it. But they have the reverse problem starting in the late afternoon when people come home, they plug in their, their, their cars, they plug in, they, they start their stoves, they turn on their lights, they run their washing machine. And so there's a tremendous ramp starting about four o'clock that the utilities have to fulfill um, to provide that energy when people really want it. And so if we could time shift that belly of the duck, if we could harness that solar, put it into batteries or put it into other kinds of storage mechanism and just time shift it a few hours to the right, uh, it would help to greatly reduce that ramp and greatly reduce the need for uh, gas peaker plants. So let's talk about, we're headed towards a world of electrifying everything. And so let me just talk about that a little bit and what that means. This is a rather busy chart, but on the left, it shows sources of energy, um, where we get our energy today. And then on the right, how do we use it? And the, the lines that connect them show, you know, wh where the uh, percentages that, it, that that represents. For example, under petroleum, 70% of the petroleum um, that's, that's harnessed is used for transportation. And so that, that top line goes straight to the right. If we could reduce the, 
impact of transportation, that's the one we really want to tackle next, right? We've done a lot down below here in terms of the grid system and using renewable energy, 56% of renewables goes into the electric grid. A substantial amount goes to residential and commercial usages. But transportation is the big one that we, we need to tackle if we're going to um, get off fossil fuel. The automakers have committed. Um, these are some of the announcements uh, in the years that the various manufacturers have said by which they intend to become fully electric with their vehicles. Um, and they're pretty aggressive. Uh, some of them are only a few years out. Some uh, For virtually all the companies now, it's, it's, it's no more than about 15 or 20 years. And so they're all intending to move towards electrics on a pretty rapid time frame. And what's driving that, frankly, you know, Concerns about climate change are certainly part of it, but EVs are just better value. They're already uh, lower in total cost of ownership than in internal combustion engines. Um, they're close to cost parity on purchase prices. Um, uh, Chevy has announced the, uh, they're going to produce a, an electric Equinox. It's going to come out this fall at a starting price of $27,000. So that starts to be very competitive with, with gas fuel vehicles. Um, very low maintenance costs and very low free fuel costs. In fact, in some cases, the fuel can be free uh, if it's if it's renewable fuel. So um, so better value, and then they're more fun to drive. They're great, have great acceleration, great handling. They're quieter, vibration free. Um, so customers are now starting to to adopt uh, EVs. I don't know if any of you are shopping for EVs. You probably are experiencing long delays in getting them because we're now past the 5% of new car purchase tipping point. And so viral adoption is starting to accelerate the trend towards, towards EVs. So that brings us to the question, is the grid really gonna be big enough? And so I like to analyze this a couple of different ways. Um, first with a thought experiment, and um, if you Google, you know, how many cars and trucks there are in California, it's about 30 million vehicles in total, 15 of each. And each category of vehicle travels on average about 12,000 miles per year. So if you just add up the miles, that's 360 billion miles roughly that are required to move vehicles within California each year. If you then turn that into an energy requirement, so what does it take to move a pound of steel down the road? Um, you know, the, the numbers here in the middle bullet show kind of what the conversion rates are for cars and for trucks and buses, but it, it really boils down to just the weight of the, the vehicle. And it's, it's difficult to make the vehicle lighter in weight. So it just takes what it takes in terms of energy to move that, that vehicle. It's not a function of batteries. It's not a function of, of, of technology or efficiency. It's just a function of weight. And the total energy required, if we're going to fully electrify all 360 billion miles, it's about 400 terawatt hours. So you might ask, well, how big is our grid today? Well, our grid today is 260. Um, that counts everything. Solar, wind, coal, oil, nuclear, hydro, everything. If you turn it all on, it's 260 terawatt hours. So if you add those together, 660 terawatt hours or somewhere in that vicinity is what we need we have less than half of what we need today. So the point here is we need every type of energy we can produce. And, uh, you know, utility scale solar and wind, distributed energy, off-grid sources, they're all going to be important to tackling that problem. And just coincidentally, in the so probably some of you from Palo Alto saw this last week in the Palo Alto Weekly, uh, cover article uh, was racing to zero. Can the state's power grid handle 12 million electric cars? And there were some good quotes in that article. You know, with 15 times more electric cars expected on the roads by 2035, the amount of power they will consume will grow exponentially. It, it, it pairs up with my thought experiment. Uh, we are not yet on track. If we take a laissez-faire approach to the market, we will not get there. Uh, we need to build solar and wind facilities at an unprecedented pace. Shifting to all renewables requires at least six gigawatts of new resources per year for the next 25 years, a pace that we've never met before. And then finally, build, building 15 times more public chargers, we're going to need 1.2 million chargers for the 8 million cars by 2030, but there's only 80,000 of them today. 
So I've talked about these limitations. Um, the other one is in resiliency, which is the grid tends not to be available when it matters most. You know, there's a bunch of folks right now in the San Gabriel Mountains who are snowed in and have been snowed in for two weeks. Uh, they, don't, they don't have enough food, their power's been out. Uh, so that's a perfect example of a case where the grid power is gone when it's an emergency and when people need it the most. And then as we've talked about, capacity is constrained um, when adding large numbers of EV chargers. There are also neighborhood grid capacity constraints. And, and one place we see these most severely is apartments and multi-unit dwellings, where there just isn't enough grid power available to add large numbers of chargers. This, this example I said, so supposing you had a big apartment complex and you wanted to add 50 level two chargers, well, that's 300 kilowatts of load. Uh, that would require an electric service of at least a thousand amp capacity, far greater than that apartment building has today. And so, so it's a big problem. It's also an equity problem because a lot of people in disadvantaged communities live in uh, apartments. And so we need to solve that problem to enable all members of society to be able to drive EVs because they need a way to charge them. So that leads us to this, which is off-grid solutions can help. And so I'm gonna talk uh, about some of those benefits, and then I'll talk about some of the things our company is doing to try to help the problem. Um, Off-grid uh, overcomes many of the limitations I've talked about. It provides the opportunity for faster deployment because there doesn't need to be a utility interconnection, and there often is a simplified permitting process. Uh, once in place, they are fully resilient. They can be available at any time because they're not dependent on the grid. Um, they're the cleanest form of energy possible uh, because most off-grid charging resources are solar powered. So they're getting that 100% of that energy from the sun. They have lower costs, including free fuel. The, fuel. the fuel is the sunshine. And that can be a big benefit to disadvantaged communities uh, where you know people are on tight budgets and, and having a, a, a source of fuel that would prevent them from having to buy gasoline would be greatly uh, beneficial to them. And you know, off-grid is really ideally suited for top-up fueling, not fill me up fueling. And I, you know, later I can talk about during the QA, I can talk about what that means, but but uh, the more you drive an EV, the more you realize that you don't need to fill it every time you uh, you charge it. It's really a top-up scenario. You just want to fill it where there's electricity available. Um, so let me talk about what we've done to try to innovate around off-grid charging. Um, this, let me just start with this. Is this is the traditional approach to building a solar canopy? Um, on the left, at the bottom there, you see pictures of kind of the foundation work that you have to do. A lot of concrete and steel in the ground. And then on the right, um, it takes workers moving up and down on ladders or on lifts, scissors lifts, to put panels into place to, uh, you know, to put that together. And it's a, a very labor intensive form of, 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 of delivering solar. So all forms of solar have become less expensive in the last 10 years, but canopies are, have, have come down the least because of these, these problems, because of the challenge of building a canopy. So what we did at Paired Power, we set out to innovate around that. And so we created something we call a pear tree, which is a small, uh, de easily deployable uh, solar canopy uh, that is also an EV charger. And it has a ballasted foundation, so it, it can be put in in a very simple manner without uh, any groundwork, any extensive groundwork. Uh, and it can also be built at ground level and then popped up into its final position. So all of the labor uh, is much more efficient because it can, they can work uh, standing on the ground, not standing on a, on a scissor lift. Uh, you can see a video of the erection process on our website, um, but we have achieved being able to put this up in a single day with a crew of two people without any kind of uh, heavy equipment. And once deployed that that solution can be an off-grid uh, EV charger, or it can optionally even be connected to the grid and, and, and augment that grid power with solar. There are many use cases for off-grid charging. If you stop and think about it, there are many places that just don't have a grid, um, you know, beaches or, or parks. 
if you go backpacking in Yosemite and you want to charge your EV, in all likelihood, there isn't much of a grid there to do that. Um, but an off-grid charger could be available there to, to allow you to return to a, a charged up car. Um, I talked about multi-unit dwellings, workplaces, retail. Um, electric school buses is a, a great um, place to use uh, off-grid and solar powered charging because the buses tend to be parked in the sunny part of the day. Schools uh, are always very happy to uh, eliminate an operating expense. And so eliminating the expense of diesel and replacing it with a zero expense for the fuel from the sun is a great scenario for them. Agriculture has been trying to figure out how to electrify. Um, farms tend to be at the end of distribution lines. The lines are not adequate to drive or charge a, a big tractor. And so having an off-grid solar powered charging source is a great uh, alternative solution. And there are many fleet applications where uh, that are good use cases for off-grid uh, charging as well. So that was a quick uh, run through. Um, looks like I stayed on time. Um, so hopefully I've demonstrated these conclusions to you. Uh, number one, that renewables really do provide the most abundant energy resource we have available. Uh, counting the sun and, and wind and all the forms of renewable we have, we have plenty of energy to meet our needs. And number two, renewables, are now the cheapest form of energy generation today. And that's driving great growth in the renewable industry. And number three, transportation electrification is following that trend and we'll experience that same tremendous growth in the, in the decades ahead. We'll all be driving EVs. If you're not already, um, you will be within the next uh, 10 or 15 years. And finally, off-grid charging resources are going to be increasingly important to address the challenges that we have with the grid. Um, they won't replace the grid, but they certainly overcome many of the constraints. They provide added resiliency and added capacity, which are going to be greatly beneficial to helping uh, us grow and produce energy where we need it. They're 100% clean and sustainable. And of course, everyone loves the free fuel. So I'll stop. Oh, let me just say a, a few words about the company. Um, Paired Power was the uh, first mover. We pioneered direct DC solar to EV off-grid charging. And we have a number of patents on that. Um, I mentioned the engineering business. We actually spun out of the engineering business a number of years ago, but the engineering business continues to operate and is uh, highly respected. Uh, does about 8% of the US solar designs in the country every year. Uh, last year and in 2021, they did two gigawatts of the approximately 24 gigawatt market. Um, and as we talked about, uh, pair, Paired Power invented Pear Tree, the world's first pop-up canopy. We we announced it in the fall and, and we're starting deliveries to customers in the second quarter of, of this year. Uh, we had a great response to our announcement. This We made the cover of the international version of PD Magazine. Um, and uh, we've just had a, a, a tremendous amount of interest in the product. So this, this is a screenshot of the, of the cover. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. And I look forward to uh, the conversation and the questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, oops. Thanks, Tom. So I just wanted to start off with an initial question, which is uh, you mentioned that you have just started with your clients um, and you're, you're getting ready to, to set up these new, these new canopies. Um, can you walk us through maybe an example of the timeline that you have created with a, one of your clients? You don't have to name the specific one, but I'm just curious, like when you're starting that conversation, how long does it take to move um, from deciding they want to do it to setting it up? You know, what's that, what's that length of time like? Yeah, that's good, uh, Wendy. So, so the, you know, we're still ramping up production. We, we we want to be to the point where we can just turnkey this for you. You know, you know, we can be very responsive. You can call us up one week and say, "I want it next week," and we'll be in a position to to deliver that for you. Um, you know, once we start shipments, that'll that'll be the goal. Uh, the installation process is very straightforward. Um, in, you know, in some jurisdictions, it may require a permit, but it. Even if it does, we believe it'll be a very simplified permit. And, and we think in a lot of places, it, it won't even require a, a permit. 
Uh, the, the pear tree is designed, uh, designed to be transportable. So once it's been put up, it can be pulled back down uh, and moved to a different location. Um, and so, so that, that's a nice benefit uh, to, for example, companies that lease their facilities and maybe they're only going to be in their facility for a few more years and they want to be able to move their charger with them when they move to a new facility. So we have that ability to, to do that. The deployment of a of a pear tree is you know, one day. Like I said, it's a it's a simple operation. Um, two workers go out with a truck with all the materials. Um, they put it up, and by the end of the day, they they drive back to the office, and it's in place and operational. Fantastic. All right. So uh, we have a question coming in from Greeny, who was curious about renewable natural gas, as that I don't think was mentioned in your overview of different energy sources. Um, can you talk a little bit about the cost of renewable natural gas compared to some other costs? Yeah, I I'm, I would have to say I'm probably not an expert on that. I would think the cost would be comparable or possibly a little higher than what I showed because you still have to uh, create that gas. And it doesn't really address climate change very well because you're, 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 you're still burning a fuel. So, so I don't, I, I guess I would just say, I don't, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I, don't have any, I don't have anything to provide on that. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, a question from David, can you comment on the batteries that you're using in your deployments for your off-grid charging? What kind of yeah. batteries? Yeah, so we're using lithium iron phosphate. That's a, a safer chemistry than anything that contains manganese or cobalt. Um, the standard configuration of, of the unit you see there in the picture is 42 kilowatt hours. Um, and um, so, so that's what we're using. Mm -hmm. And is the the size of your canopy always kind of a, 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 a consistent size or do you customize any of that kind of stuff? Uh, so it is a consistent size. It's uh, 10 solar modules. Those are bifacial solar modules. So they are designed and, and the structure is designed to allow the frame to be unobstructed. So, so reflected light uh, can be captured that's coming up from the ground as well as the light uh, hitting the top surface. Uh, bifacial panels, when they're unobstructed like that, they they get an, a a boost in energy yield. It might be ten or ten or fifteen percent more energy. Um, so that helps us increase the the energy quotient without having any kind of moving parts, uh, which we think is a great benefit. We will probably look at other sizes of structure in the future. Um, maybe some that are a little bit bigger that might span more parking spaces, uh, but with the same uh, concept but we haven't uh, introduced those yet. Great, thank you so much. So a question from Kat is about using these um, kinds of technologies in rural areas, which I think you mentioned was a kind yes. of an advantage of paired power. So in a rural area, um, you might have an unstable grid. Um, what kind of comments or advice do you have for um, using this technology there? Yeah, I think it's perfect for that application. I mean, the, the only real limitation is you it does need to be in a spot that has that's flat. Um, you can't put it on the, the side of a hillside, but but there's plenty of places with flat ground. Rural communities and, and farms do tend to be on flat ground anyway. And so it's a perfect deployment model for that kind of application. Is that a just a safety concern with the Yes. The, okay. Yeah, just to just to uh, keep it in place, right? Because it is ballasted, right? Got it. A uh, question from Bruce. Can you compare the cost of your canopy solution to ground-mounted solar? So it, it's a good question. So, so ground-mounted solar is the cheapest form of solar. But what you have to think about here is you're getting a number of benefits in this structure. You're getting a solar system. You're getting a battery system. You're getting an EV charger. And you're getting the time value of the money it would take for the delay in waiting for it to be deployed. And, and oh, and then you're also getting free energy. So you're getting all of those benefits rolled into one. Um, for EV charger projects that are grid connected, if you go to PG&E today and you say, I, I want to do an EV charger project, it's about a two year wait for a super service drop from PG&E. So, so that's what I mean about the time value of money. If, if, if the objective is fast deployment, uh, we certainly attain that. Um, 
The other thing I'll say is, of course, this is eligible for all of the incentives, uh, the solar ITC. Uh, as an American manufacturer, we can get and uh, offer the customer a 40% um, uh, federal ITC, and all of the uh, incentives that kind of go along with that, um, accelerated depreciation, EV charger incentives, low carbon fuel standard credits, uh, all of those kinds of things. So, so that brings down the cost substantially. So on a cost per kilowatt hour basis, we're, we're cheaper or at the same price of any other type of solar. Great. And a sort of follow up to that, Bruce was asking about the costs associated with connecting your canopy to the grid. I think you already talked about some reasons, maybe the permitting and the waiting time for why you, it would be more right. difficult to connect. But are there some additional associated costs? You know, as we sell it to you, it comes ca capable of doing that. And it can't, you know, the inverter that that is on board is capable of a grid connection. Um, but there would be additional costs. You, you would typically have to trench uh, to put underground conductors back to the, you know, wherever you're going to tie uh, grid tie this into a facility. Um, there'd be some permitting costs and some engineering costs um, and some interconnection costs um, to go along with that, just as there would be with any other solar project. Great. Thank you so much. So here's a question from Annie, and I'm not sure that I 100% understand the question, but I think she's saying, sounds like a perfect solution for our homeowners association. And she has a question about uh, what is the return on the investment for this kind of approach? Like, um, I guess she's saying over time, perhaps. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how to answer that. I, I mean, I've talked about the incentives. I would encourage her to contact us and we can uh, explore what uh, might apply in her unique cir uh, circumstances, because I think that's the best way to answer the question. In general, as I said, the cost per kilowatt hour over the life of the system is is very competitive. So, Great. Um, I think you talked about the stability issue already. Um, somebody was asking what about windy weather, but I think that sounds like it would be similar to the hilly conditions. Well, we're so we're uh, we intend to deliver this with a a stamped letter from a structural engineer that'll that'll qualify how it can be deployed in 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 what wind zones it can be deployed. Um, and so we're not quite concluded with that analysis yet, but it looks very favorable. We'll, we'll be able to deploy it in in many locations. We do have the option of adding ground screws, which is a type of screw that secures the foundation to the to the ground, and that greatly increases uh, its ability to resist wind uplift. Um, and it's not difficult to install those, so it's not a complex process. So, so we have that as a as a solution as well. Thank you. Um, one question is, let's see, would you agree? This is a question from Aaron. Would you agree that two-way charging capacity in EVs would expand the flexible uses of your chargers, allowing people to power their homes after charging up during the day at a pop-up charger? So is there some capacity, I guess, for kind of vehicle to grid or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so vehicle to grid is, is a very interesting technology, and I agree with his point. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential benefit. Um, it, 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 it could solve things like it would help with the duck curve, for example, because we can harness the energy in vehicles, inject it when it's needed, and then later, like at night, when the grid is not particularly heavily loaded, uh, recharge those vehicles. Uh, it could be used for backup power for, for residences, as he points out. There's a number of, of nice benefits. Um, I don't think it solves the grid capacity problem for the reason that I explained that you know, we need a certain number of kilowatt hours just to move the weight of the vehicles around. And, and the fact that you inject that energy back into the grid, um, it might help at a particular point in time when the grid is, is, is tightly constrained, but it doesn't reduce the total number of kilowatt hours that are needed to electrify everything. Um, so, but I think it's a great technology. The, the, the challenge right now is that very few vehicles are capable of doing it. Um, all virtually all of the EVs that have been sold in the market in the last ten years, uh, almost none of them are capable of doing vehicle to grid, and and so that's that's an impediment. Until the vehicle manufacturers make it more widely available, it's difficult to do a, a V to G. Yeah, that sounds like that's the next frontier for the right. EVs to figure that question out. Thank you. 
Uh, question from Nancy. Any thoughts to share about non PV solar? I assume she's talking about solar thermal. Is there any application that you could find with this? Yeah, so, well, I saw that one of your other speakers is going to be talking about CSP, uh, concentrating solar power. And, and that includes different types of thermal. Um, if some of you probably have seen the pictures of Ivanpah, which is the big salt tower that was built in the desert that has these mirrors that concentrate the energy into a, 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 a molten salt, basically, that then is used to heat water to drive turbines. Um, it's interesting. I, they, they've not been able to get the cost down where they need to be, and PV keeps getting cheaper. And so with that kind of pressure, I think it's it could be challenging for CSP to to scale uh, and 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 be a, a, a you know an alternative. But I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, there's certainly a lot of interest in it. It, it has some benefits with storage because once you've heated a, a fluid like a like water or or molten salt, you can store that heat uh, for long periods of time and then inject it when you need the energy. And so it does have some built-in storage capacity, which is which is potentially pretty useful. Um, so, but they it, it it's just a case of that they have to get the costs uh, more in line with. Uh, solar plus storage, solar, solar plus battery storage. Right. Uh, we've seen a couple questions coming in about whether you are considering this pear tree model for individual households. Could you put this at the end of your driveway? Could you just have this for a, a home? Are there any considerations for that? Is it just about how much space you have? You have to have space. And, and we, we certainly are interested in the possibility of that. Uh, we think we'll probably be selling uh, to residential customers through dealers, and we're exploring that right now, uh, looking for dealers that we can sign up, and and then they in turn would sell the the system and do the installation for us. Um, so we're certainly open to it. Yes, we think it's interesting. Um, there are we're also interested in you know in island economies like like Hawaii is a good case point. Um, they're very sunny. They they have very short driving distances so it's it's not difficult to have an ev in terms of the driving distances but their grid is very expensive and so it it, it potentially is a good uh in an off-grid charging solution is potentially a very good complement to their needs um and and complement to the to the fact that they have so much sunshine and so we we've seen interest from island economies with residential deployment um so we're interested in that as well so one question uh, that just occurred to me as I was looking out my window at this rainy weather we're having today is if you have an extended period of rainy days, does that do anything to the effectiveness of this canopy? It does, yeah, and that's the reason for the batteries. Um, we do our best to capture everything available um, throughout the day, uh, all the solar energy that's available, store that in a battery, and then make that available to the vehicles. It, it's a little bit of a heuristic challenge. You're, we're, we're always looking how much sun is available, how much is a available in, in the battery at the current moment and how much is the car requesting and then trying to match those as, as best we can. Um, you know, to the earlier point that I made about, about topping up that, that you know, pe people who are coming from a gas driving experience, it, it takes a little while for them to realize that the fueling paradigm for EVs is different. Um, you know, when you buy, when you drive a gas car, you you go to the gas station. Why do you go to the gas station? Because that's where the gas is. And, and, and as a consequence, you want to fill up so that you don't have to go back to that gas station for a month or whatever your time frame is until the next time you, you, you need it. With an EV, it's not really the case. Electricity is available everywhere. There doesn't have to be a gas station. It's available. You can have electricity at home, at work, at school, at church. You know, it's always available. And so the par the fueling paradigm is more of a top up. I, I just want to get enough. Like if I'm at work, I want to get enough to get home. If I'm at home, I want to get enough to get to go to school. And and so, you know, I've been driving an EV for 12 years. I, I rarely fill it. Um, I The only time I fill it is when I've taken a trip on the highway. Um, and then I do use a fast charger. But the rest of the time, I, I just top up. And so with that model, even with rainy days and getting less is is more than adequate for many, many people. That's the point I'm trying to make. Right. So uh, one question is, what would the 
speed or rate of the charging compared to is it something like a similar to a level two or more level like two. A level? yes okay level two yes yeah it's not intended to be a fast charger right okay that makes sense for the the given situations that you're using it in yeah um and then we have a few other questions coming in but we're almost out of time so we'll just take a few more questions uh this one is, are there any battery considerations for high fire risk areas? You did mention that your battery was a safer type of um, safer chemistry. Yeah, lithium iron phosphate has much less battery risk. The, the, the batteries that have manganese and cobalt in them, the problem with those is that they are self-oxygenating. So if they catch fire, it's very difficult to put, put the fire out. Um, but LFP does not suffer from that consequence. So so um, it's it's a safe chemistry for for deployment in remote locations. Great. And do you have any kind of um, setup for maintaining these uh, structures? Um, we don't think it's going to take much maintenance. We do have a service, uh, you know, the ability to service them, and and the chargers are are connected via via cell modem. So we 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 are always knowing what condition they're in or or if if they need maintenance for example or if they're offline we would know that and be able to dispatch somebody um but we're not anticipating that this this needs much maintenance there's no moving parts uh, there's nothing really to fail so great well um i was hoping you could just answer one more question um where do you want to see this uh company and this direction in the next i don't know 5 years or so what would be uh, a great outcome for you. Well, so we're we're not the only off-grid uh, solution out there, but all of them are fairly new. And and you know, as I've talked about, there's a genuine important need for off-grid sources of, of energy, and that need is going to grow. It's going to be there's going to be increasing demand for it in the future. And so we just want to be part of that. Uh, we think we have a great uh, opportunity and uh, and a great solution. Uh, we have a great team here. And we're proud of what we've accomplished and want to continue to help uh, offset the challenges with climate change. Great. And would you mind putting up your slide with your contact information again so people can find out how to get in touch it, with you? It's the one on the screen there. If, oh, it, there you go. It, that's my email address and that's our website. Um, I didn't put the phone number there, but most people email these days. So I think that'll be enough. Great. And any final thoughts you have? No, just thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks for the very engaging uh, questions. Good, uh, you were a very good audience. So we have, I appreciate it very much and look forward to continuing the collaboration with Actera. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have any other questions, you can email us at events at actera.org. And I encourage you to uh, attend our upcoming lectures. The next one is April 19th with Anna Bowat and Nahum Goldberg, and our final lecture, May 18th. Um, thank you so much, Tom, and we'll look forward to all of the stuff that you have coming up in the future. All right. Thank you all. Bye now. Thanks.